Hello, hello, everyone. It's Lennon. It's been a while since I've talked about religion on the channel. <laughs> I am an advocate for staying true to yourself and staying true to your beliefs, not letting anything mess with that. And as someone who grew up in a very pious, I guess you could say household, um, in terms of like how I grew up, it was a Christian household and there were lots of rules and lots of dogma. And I guess I wanted to talk today about being in the broom closet. I guess this, I guess you could say that this video idea came about from a conversation that I had with a sibling recently. And as someone who has family, that's very, that's very much still pious, that still talks to me, still talks at me and down to me in a condescending way about no longer going to church. They have no idea what my spiritual beliefs are and they have no idea that I'm a witch. They have no idea that I do anything with the craft. I do believe that that would send my mother into a very early grave and I'm not joking. So these things, these conversations, these things arise where my family tends to think that they have some sort of right to talk at me about these things, first of all. Um, but it does come from a place of where our belief, where that belief that they are in is. There's a huge emphasis in my, in, in my family's branch of Christianity in ministering to people that my family firmly believes that their mission, the reason that they were put on this earth is to tell others about Jesus. Okay. And while I guess in their own brains, that's a beautiful experience, but conversion was never, never going to be part of my life. I was, I, I saw so much diversity in my schools that I had went to that it was never acceptable for me, myself and I, Lennon, to go up to someone and tell them that they had to worship my God. That was never going to fucking happen. That's never going to happen now. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Sorry, can't do it, won't do it. There you go. And I got a lot of backlash from my church family. We called them, the, the, we called them our family. Um, there was a lot of backlash from my parents and other people in this, in the church that thought they had a right to talk at me too. Um, that's yet, that, these were boundaries that I had to erect around myself. Um, I have to know when to put my fence up in terms of conversation and in terms of specific dialogues, in terms of coming at me in terms of like in relation to my children. There are times when I have to erect my fence. Being in the broom closet is not the goal. No one wants to stay in the broom closet. Okay. But in my life, it just seems to be where I'm going to stay. I have a sibling that is an ordained minister. Being a minister, I think that this is an overall thing. <laughs> Being a pastor, minister, or a preacher, they tend to have this knack for wanting to get into religious philosophical chats with people and really they, they want to get into these conversations with folks. So one holiday or one birthday or something, we were sitting around playing a game and the concept of original sin came up, right? And I'm just giving you examples of how being in the broom closet, I guess what it looks like and how it can play out. And that can only come from a personal personal place. I, this is gonna come from personal experience, I guess you could say, but I just wanted to see, I just wanted to share what it looked like because for me, the conversation, I have to know upfront how the conversation is gonna go in order to know when to erect my fence, when to tell people, okay, we're veering off into unacceptable territory here. I'm sorry, but we're going to have to talk about something else. Things like that. There's, there's moments inside conversations and inside conversations that I have to, for me, not necessarily for them, but for me, I have to stop and I have to put my boundaries in place. And it's about accountability. It's about keeping those fences there. Because you never know, you may, you may get into what you consider a very good dialogue with someone and it can turn ugly really fast. And I'm going to get back to this with the original sin conversation. So of course the, you know, we were playing a game. I think we were playing some kind of card game or something, you know, sitting around after dinner at, at my parents' house and the conversation led to original sin. Now as an ordained minister, okay, like I already said, he really likes to hear himself talk just something, you know, about, 
what I believe is a universal thing for preachers, ministers, and pastors. They like to hear themselves talk about what they believe and getting all religious and philosophical. You know, they could talk for hours. And so that's very much what happened here. This sibling of mine, he goes into talking about the original sin and what do we all think about that and, um, you know, naming, naming scriptures and things like that. So it kind of turned into a pseudo Bible study, I guess you could say. And I said that I really believe that all of this is symbolic, that, you know, this has nothing to do with um, anything but telling us that temptation is the highest form of not being true to ourselves or our God. Kind of, that's kind of where I went with that. Okay. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was, it was that, it was like, that was the post posted note that I put on that conversation. And within a few minutes of everyone kind of spouting their goo, he said, well, you know, that's all fun and good, but actually, okay. Now when he said that, I already felt myself getting angry because when he said, well, actually, that suggests just in that little bitty word right there that what he was about to say was law. Okay, so I was already feeling, uh, I, was already, <laughs> I was already feeling a little something. So I looked at my husband and I was like, okay, we get ready to run, you know, <laughs> that kind of look. And uh, I don't mean to be funny about it. I just, that's kind of what happened in this situation. And he, after he said, well, actually, it's, it's, it was all on Adam. The original sin here is that Adam could not control Eve. And I remember going, oh no, the fuck he just done. I just say that. He did not just say that. Did he just say that? Somebody say that he's, somebody tell me whether or not that came out of his mouth. <laughs> and I remember going, Seriously, I mean, I just, you know, because how I am here is how I'm everywhere, folks, okay? I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty raw. And I just remember going, seriously, this is what you believe. It's not temptation in general, but it's the fact that somehow Adam is on this pedestal as the man and he couldn't control his woman? How outdated are you? <laughs> I mean, I just... And it seemed like the whole room froze. Like, nobody was breathing, nobody was talking. And then it kind of like, you know, everybody started talking again and whatever, whatever. And I looked at this sibling and I, I just remember saying, say something now. I've never wanted to slap that sibling so hard. Okay. <laughs> and... I guess looking back, I can laugh about it, but I was fucking angry, okay? That it wasn't this sim symbolism of temptation. It wasn't the fact that Adam was lustful to Eve and that's why he forgot to tell her about the apple, okay? Which we could go off that. But it was that he couldn't control Eve is what he said. And I was like, please explain that. That's what I said. After I, my outburst, I was like, explain that to me. God's giving us clues, Lennon, as to how a marriage, how a relationship between man and wife, man and wife, he said man and wife, first of all, uh, uh, man and wife is supposed to go. The man is the all. The man is supposed to control his woman. And I thought, what year is it? What fucking year is it? Okay. Oh. So I remember being very angry. I remember being, uh, being very defen uh, defensive. And I remember being like, I really wanted to just shove my goo of knowledge, <laughs> my anthropological knowledge onto his face. Uh, but I didn't. I literally looked at my husband and I was like, I need to get out of here. Because no one's about to convince you that you're, so, you're higher than me. Okay. No one's going to do that. <laughs> First of all, he's not about to convince you that you have some sort of hierarchy over me. Because that's not about to happen. Okay. I'll knock you off that pedestal real fucking fast. 
Um, but I think that the fact that he believed this and that there was, there was a whole bunch of faith surrounding this topic that he wanted to talk about. And it was my reaction, my reaction that I had to pay attention to in that moment. Sure, I could have come at him from a defensive place, from an angry place, from a, uh, from a place of judgment. And I didn't want to do that. And so I had to stop the conversation. I had to erect my fence and I'd be like, oh, okay. First of all, good luck finding a girlfriend with that attitude. <laughs> and second, thank you for this discussion, but we're going to have to move on to something else, right? And it's about knowing yourself in that situation. Now, here's what not being in the closet would have gone in that way. And I could have talked about real ways in which I believe. And if my family had been accepting of other beliefs, then the conversation could have led to a beautiful place. It could have gone to a beautiful place. It could have been like, oh, well, I can see where you think that, Lennon. That's... You know, I'm happy for you. No. Okay. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. All right. Kenny Rogers, sing me away. The, the thing that being in the, the, the real thing here about being in the witchy closet is that I believe that all spiritual paths, belief systems, religions, whatever, are you, yourself, and you. You, yourself, I. Okay. They are very personal. They come from a personal place. And they have to stay there. Your path is your path. No one's on this path with you. Okay? Even if you're in some kind of religious sect or order or coven, it's all how you ex your life experiences reflect how you experience new things. And I don't believe that anyone has the right to tell you that you're on the wrong path or something like that. So it's about not allowing them to have a place there because in my anger, defensiveness, or however I could have gone at that conversation, that's me sacrificing my path because then I'm not walking my path. I'm too busy defending my path. I've got my frying pan here and I'm just, and people are attacking me, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere on my path. I'm not furthering myself. I'm not, I'm not using my spiritual path to come at the conversations from a very, from a peace, from a peaceful place, from a more peaceful place, from a more place of grace and not allowing them to chip away at my own faith not allowing them to chip away at my belief system. Because once I do that, I believe that kind of takes, that veers you off your own path. So it's about turning it back around on self, I guess. But there's some examples of some conversations that I've had with my family that have led me to understand more that with being in the witchy closet is for me that this will probably never be something that I will come out of with my family. Now, I'm not saying that I don't, won't come out to very specific people. I do believe that uh, I have to be uh, kind of specific with it. I have to say, okay, well, I can talk to my sister about this, right? She knows where I stand. She knows that we can't really talk about this in front of some other people in our family, she knows not to bring this up to my mother. It's not like a, it's not about being a secret. It's more so about her respecting my boundary that my boundary lies within us having conversations. And that's it. It's not about her holding some secret over my head. Right. And you have to kind of know when that's the case as well, whether you tell someone that you think is in your corner and they turn around and use the shit against you. So you have to kind of know them too. And you have to know yourself and you get that intuition with that other person. You get that vibe. Okay. You get that read on that other person and figure out whether that's even something that you can utilize with them, that relationship, that dynamic, them holding the secret of yours. Right. I don't think of it in that way 
with my sister, but other people I might. I might go, ooh, I don't know about sharing this with you because I don't know what you're going to do with this information. You get hit with these emotional traumas. You get hit with these instances where you're not really sure what to do. You have to know your boundaries. You have to know what is acceptable in terms of conversation, in terms of how much power are you going to give them over your life, over your spiritual path. And realizing that they don't have any to begin with. They don't. They only have enough power if you give them to it, if you give them that power. This could be other people. This doesn't have to be family. And with me, it just tends to be my family because I don't have any like, like friends that aren't related to me. But if ever I felt like the conversation would turn into a dark place, a place of regret, shame, guilt, I would have to stop that. I would have to work on me to know that they may be coming at me with their own versions of their shadow shit. So I guess I just wanted to give some examples today as to what it may look like being in the closet, some the way conversations may arise and how you really have to sit with yourself. You really have to know at what point the conversation is not benefiting either one of the parties and at what point you're giving them some power that that doesn't belong to them. So it's about knowing that. Figuring out where your conversational boundaries are, figuring out where your boundaries are in terms of your path. And then, of course, looking at your power. What is your power? If you were to give this power to someone else, what would that lead? So now, one big disclaimer at the end of this video, I do not live with my parents. When I did live with them, there were certain things that I had to do to keep my path secret. I couldn't have a lot of tools. I couldn't have a lot of books on the subject. So that very much, I feel like at the beginning, it hindered my path because I wanted so much to be immersed in that world solely, but I couldn't. So I felt like it hindered my path, but now looking back, it didn't. That experience of mine helped me shape what is not needed in my practice now. Like those tools that I may have loved back in the day weren't really going to benefit me anyway. They don't benefit me now. I don't have to have them. I don't have them now. Some of them I don't even have. And it kind of shaped and molded me as to who I am as a witch. And I have to look at the bricks that make up myself as well. So, but in terms of inside this disclaimer, I'll say I don't live with them. I do live alone or I do live outside of my parents' house. So I don't have that sitting on top of me. So if you're someone that is interested in this stuff and is kind of on a, on some, some conscious level, Know that, that you have to stay in the broom closet. It's imperative for you to know you. It's imperative to know when you hit these, these walls of your, you know, where your emotional walls, where you begin to get angry or defensive, you know, that's you giving your power to this other person and you need to stop and look at yourself. Anyway, I just wanted to come on and talk about the broom closet because of some conversations that I've had with family and how... At this time in my life, being in the broom closet is still very much a part of my life. It's a big part of my life with in, in terms of family. And I'll probably stay there for a while. And it's about knowing me. And it's about knowing where my where I'm at in my healing journey with all that, with that old life of mine. And I guess just share a little about what it looks like. So I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions about being in the broom closet or if you're in the broom closet and have a tip, leave them below. I'd love to get in the dialogue about this. Um... I know that everyone's closet looks different. Uh, I know they all smell like feet, <laughs> but I know everyone, everyone's closet looks different. So if you have anything to add to this conversation, I'd love to hear about it. Please share it. Much love.